This is a video lecture of the musculoskeletal system for AMP. So the musculoskeletal system consists of, I'm sure you've already guessed this, muscles and the skeleton or the bones in the body. Oh, skeleton, I put an S there. So, um, the purpose of the musculoskeletal system is basically, um, well, two things. The skeleton serves to give structure to the body, right? So picture something like a jellyfish. They don't have any bones. They're literally called jelly, right? Uh, versus something like a human or a dog or a cat where uh, we have bones and we have more structure to our body. And then muscles are responsible for moving that skeleton. Uh, so the muscles are responsible for moving the body um, and then as well there's also muscles in like the organs and those guys are responsible for uh, you know moving things through the organs. So muscles are responsible for movement. So let's talk about muscles first. So there are three types. Let's gonna move this over a bit. So three types of muscles. We have skeletal muscles. These ones move the skeleton. Okay, so we have control over these ones, which means that they are voluntary. Uh, there's also smooth muscle. Smooth muscle is in organs. So it's involuntary. We don't have control over these ones. So, for example, smooth muscles in the intestines. So we don't have to think about or tell our intestines to move food through them. Uh, they just do it on their own. So that's, a, that's an involuntary muscle. And then our third type, any guesses where it's located? It's cardiac muscle. So cardi, we remember from our roots, is for the heart. Cardiac muscle is in the heart. Uh, and these guys also, I'm sure you know this, are involuntary. Again, we don't have to tell our heart to beat, it just goes ahead and does it. So uh, there are four muscles that uh, you should know the names of. Four muscles. Um, so I don't expect you to know the names of any other muscle, just these four. Uh, so we have the hamstrings. We have the quadriceps, we have the triceps, and we have the apaxial. So, um, <clears throat> I have a little diagram, I'm just pulling it out here. So that right there shows you where all those muscles are. So the hamstrings are in the hind part of the hind leg, right above the stifle. This is the stifle. This is the hock. So the hamstrings here are, are behind. We also have the quadriceps available at the front. Um, then in the foreleg, we have the triceps. So this is the elbow here. It's above the elbow. And then in the back area, we, so right above the hip, we have the lumbar muscles or the apaxial muscles. So in all honesty, these are all injection site um, muscles. And that's why these are the four that you guys need to know, because these are sites that we can give IM or intramuscular injections. Uh, the thing is though, of these four, really, you're probably only ever gonna use A and C. So the hamstrings and the apaxial. For my preference personally, I like to give IM injections in the apaxial unless I can't help it otherwise. I have never given an injection in the quadriceps or the triceps. They're difficult areas to access um, and they're not as well tolerated by the animal. So I don't even bother with those two. I just stick with the apaxial or the hamstrings. Okay, so um, we've talked about our muscles and that's kind, of, that's kind of it for muscle conversation. We don't really have too much to know about the muscles. The skeleton on the other hand, we're gonna discuss in a lot more depth. So we do need to know, we need to learn about the bones of the skeleton. So again, I've got my little diagram here. I'm gonna zoom in.
zoom in a bit on it so that you can see uh, a little bit better. I don't know, it's not great. Okay. And actually, first, I'm just going to make a little, a couple notes here for you under the skeleton. So there are two uh, terms you should know when we're talking about the skeleton. So the first is um, the axial skeleton. So the axial skeleton is composed of the skull, the spine, the ribs, and the sternum. And then we have the appendicular skeleton. And this is made up of the appendages, right? Or the limbs. So the axial skeleton, if you picture a snake, the axial skeleton is everything a snake would have. Uh, the appendicular skeleton is everything that the snake wouldn't have, right? So that's limbs. So talking about this diagram then, I'm going to discuss the axial skeleton first. So that's the skull, the spine, the ribs, and the sternum. So you can see on this diagram, it's kind of sloppy. It has some extra writing all over it. Um, this is just like my notes copy, so sorry it's not awesome. Um, I tried to find like a more blank one that isn't all written on for this, but uh, I don't have any here and I don't have a printer to print stuff. So unfortunately, I'm kind of high and dry here. So uh, we're gonna use our messy diagram and we're gonna run with it. So you can see on this diagram, we already have some things labeled, right? Cranial, meaning towards the head. Caudal, meaning towards the tail. Dorsal, meaning towards the back. Ventral, meaning towards the belly. We have palmar, the bottom of the front feet. We have plantar, the bottom of the hind feet. We also have, it's not labeled on here, but distal being furthest from the point of attachment and proximal, nearest to the point of attachment on a limb. Um, and then we have medial and lateral, which is a little bit tricky to, de to demonstrate on a 2D diagram, right? But medial is more towards the side, uh, or sorry, lateral is more towards the side, right? Lateral means side. And then medial is more towards the midline. And then as well, on the head itself, we also have the term rostral, meaning towards the nose. Uh, it's kind of cut off there, I see, rostral. Okay, so I'm going to go through the axial skeleton first, and I'm going to go through it cranial to caudal. Okay, so most towards the head to most towards the tail. So I'm going to go in order. So our first bone here is the skull. Um, this guy right here, that's the orbit. That is where, um, that's like basically the eye socket. It's where the eye goes. Then we have the mandible. The mandible is the lower jaw and that's the only movable bone in the skull. So uh, an animal's eating or chewing or vocalizing, that mandible is the only thing moving. The upper jaw here, I'm just gonna draw a thing there, is the maxilla. So the maxilla is the upper jaw. Sorry, I'll move it over. And then the mandible is the lower jaw. So a little further back on this diagram, I have the hyoid bones. Um, I don't think that's included on the diagram that I gave you guys. Uh, if you want to draw it in, you certainly can. Uh, the hyoid bone is what anchors the tongue. So that's the bone that the tongue um, is, uh, is attached to. So moving more caudal or more towards the tail, we're going to move into the spine now. So the bones of the neck are called the cervical vertebrae. Don't be concerned about these numbers, okay? Um, all animals have a vertebral formula, so how many bones are in each section. You don't need to know those, so just ignore the numbers. Uh, but just as a fun and interesting fact, I think, all mammals, one of the definitions of a mammal is that they all have seven cervical vertebrae. So that means that pugs with their short, stubby little necks have seven cervical vertebrae. And giraffes with their like six foot tall neck still only have seven cervical vertebrae. I think that's a really phenomenal fact and I like to share that with my students. Anyways, moving on, our cervical vertebrae make up our neck. Look at your word parts, right? Cervic, cervic was meaning neck. Moving more caudal, we have our thoracic vertebrae, right? Thorac meaning the chest. So these are the ones that move over the chest. 
The thoracic vertebrae are the ones that all the ribs interact with. So there's 13 thoracic vertebrae, there are 13 ribs. Most of those ribs are connected to the sternum or the breastbone with cartilage. Uh, except for this last guy, you see he doesn't have any cartilage attachment. This last guy is called a floating rib. Sometimes owners will call you in a panic because they think their dog has a mass or some kind of lump on their side. It's often just that floating rib. Uh, one of my mom's dogs had a floating rib that was literally like a hook, uh, like a candy cane. It flipped out and towards the uh, like more lateral space, so it was like that. And, um, and when you pet her on the side, you could totally feel it sticking out. Uh, so that's a floating rib. So the thoracic vertebrae articulate with the ribs. The ribs connect with cartilage to the sternum or the breastbone. Uh, moving more caudal now, we have the lumbar vertebrae. The lumbar vertebrae are over the abdomen. Uh, then we have the sacral vertebrae. So the sacral vertebrae articulate with the uh, pelvis. These bones are all fused. So they're fused. There's three, but they're all stuck together. So these are the equivalent of um, like our tailbone, but I don't like to call it a tailbone in animals because they actually have tail bones, as we can see. So the, um, the tail vertebrae are called either coccygeal or the caudal vertebrae. Coccygeal is more common of the term, but you will see caudal vertebrae as well. So coccygeal is how you pronounce that one there. Okay, so we've gone through our axial skeleton now. So now I'm gonna go through our appendicular skeleton. So I'm gonna start more with the more cranial limb, the forelimb, and I'm going to go from proximal or nearest of the point of attachment to distal, which is furthest from the point of attachment to the body. So uh, our very first bone that we encounter here is the scapula. So the scapula is the shoulder blade. The scapula is a flat bone. I'm maybe gonna write that here for you. Scapula equals flat bone. So that's an example of a flat one, okay? <clears throat> Uh, moving more distal now, our next bone is the humerus. So that's the equivalent of like our upper arm. Then we have uh, the radius and the ulna. So this one here that sticks out, that's the ulna. And then we have the radius here, okay? Um, so the radius is a little bit of the smaller one. So there are two bones there in the forearm. Um, and then moving a little bit more distal, we have our carpals. So the carpals are like the wrist, right? So we know that from our word parts that carp meant wrist. And then we have a little bit beyond that, the metacarpals. So word parts again, meta means beyond. So we have carpals and then we have the beyond carpals. So a little bit further next is the metacarpals, right? And then lastly, we have our phalanges. So phalanges, remember, is plural. So one individual is a phalanx, but typically we talk about them all together being the phalanges. The phalanges are the toes. Uh, one bone I kind of skipped over is this one right here. That's the clavicle. It's not part of the appendicular skeleton, even though it does look like it is here. Uh, the clavicle is the... Um, um, shoot, what is the common name for it? Oh, I'm drawing a blank here, but it's like we have one. It's in our chest. Collarbone. There we go. Um, so uh, that's the that's the uh, collarbone. So we have collarbones and cats have collarbones or the clavicle, but dogs do not have a clavicle. So clavicle is what is responsible. Like having that bone allows us to bring our arms together like for a hug. Um, but dogs can't really do that and cats can and that's because they have a clavicle. Okay, so moving on now to the hind limb. So the most proximal bone in the hind limb is the pelvis. Interestingly, the pelvis is actually made up of three different bones, three on each side, so it's a total of six. Uh, but um, we're good here to just know that this bone is the pelvis. 
So uh, the pelvis articulates with the femur, which is our most next most distal bone. Uh, so the femur is the long upper bone of the hind limb. Then we have in our knee, this tiny little guy here is the patella. Uh, so the patella is the kneecap. We have a kneecap, you can probably feel it in your knee. Dogs and cats have kneecaps or patellas as well. Uh, dogs, patellas, little dogs, you'll often see them, um, if you ever seen like a little Pomeranian or a Yorkie or Chihuahua or something running along and then all of a sudden they're, they have like one leg sticking straight back and they're kind of hopping and then they'll go right back to running. That's because their patella luxated or it moved out of place. Uh, and then it popped back in and they were able to walk normally again. Um, dogs that have a luxating patella, they typically need to have surgery to repair that. Uh, so that is part of the knee, the patella. Moving more distal, we have the tibia and the fibula. So it's a little bit hard to tell in some diagrams, but the fibula is lateral to the tibia. So the tibia is the more medial bone, the fibula is the more lateral bone. Then we have our tarsals, which make up the hock joint. And then just like we had metacarpals beyond the carpal, we have metatarsals beyond the tarsal. So the metatarsals are the long bones here, and then we have the, uh, the phalanges and the toes, okay? So speaking of long bones, um, so I, I told you about the flat bone, so the, uh, or the, sorry, the scapula is categorized as a flat bone. We also talk about long bones. Uh, so the humerus and the femur are both examples of long bones. So when we talk about the terms, I'll get a little bit more into that. Um, but for now, just know that the humerus and the femur are examples of long bones. So you might be thinking, great, I have to know all of this. And sorry, yes, you do. Um, but um, I do have an exercise for you that is a skeleton that you can label. So that will help you to learn where the bones are and to use that for study purposes. I also have some good news or possibly bad news, depending on your outlook. Um, good news is you do not have to complete a diagram of the skeleton. So yay, that's exciting news. The bad news is how we're going to test you on if you know the location of the bones is by asking you to describe the location of the bones using these cranial, caudal, distal, ventral, uh, medial, lateral, distal, and proximal. Okay. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. So let's say, for example, I ask you, uh, where is the thoracic vertebrae to the lumbar vertebrae? Okay, so this, let's say this is our test question. So what, what the t question is asking us, the question is where is the thoracic vertebrae? So that's our question. And then where is it to the lumbar vertebrae or in relation to the lumbar vertebrae? So this right here, I like to call it um, the anchor, right? Uh, I'm gonna try to draw an anchor. Um, now, I'm, now I'm not sure how anchors look. I think that's it, I don't know. Pretend that's an anchor. I'm drawing a blank on what they look like. Uh, so that's an anchor. So our anchor is the lumbar. So if we think of our diagram or we have our diagram in front of us, we can put our finger, I'm just gonna bump this up so you can see the question still. We can put our finger on the anchor. So we're on the lumbar vertebrae right, right, right now. So where is the thoracic vertebrae? It's here. And if I draw the arrow, I'm drawing the arrow in the same direction as cranial. So the answer is the thoracic vertebrae are cranial to the lumbar vertebrae, okay? So it doesn't have to be two things side by side. I could ask you, where's the skull in relation to the lumbar vertebrae? So again, in relation to the lumbar, the lumbar is my anchor. Where is the skull? The skull is my question mark. So where is it? If I drew an arrow in the direction of the skull, it's also cranial. So if I'm using my lumbar as a reference point again, and I ask, where is the coccygeal vertebrae to the lumbar vertebrae? The lumbar vertebrae serves as my anchor. 
the coccygeal vertebrae is the tail. So if I draw my arrow towards the tail, it's caudal. So the coccygeal vertebrae are caudal to the lumbar vertebrae. Okay? So uh, I've kind of done cranial and caudal examples. Let's do a couple others. So let's say we're talking about um, the ribs. So if I said, where are the ribs in relation to the thoracic vertebrae? So the thoracic vertebrae is um, here. That's my anchor, right? Where, uh, in relation to the thoracic vertebrae. And then the question is, where are the ribs in relation? So the ribs, it's kind of hard to tell in a 2D diagram, but picture our spine and our ribs. The ribs are to the side, right? So they're lateral to the thoracic vertebrae. Um, if I asked you, where is the fibula in relation to the tibia, the, t the fibula is lateral to the tibia, okay? Um, now, if I asked you, where is the thoracic vertebrae to the sternum? So where is the thoracic? The thoracic is the question. In relation to the sternum, the sternum is my anchor. So where's the thoracic? It's more towards the back, which means it's dorsal. So the thoracic vertebrae are dorsal to the sternum. Okay, so now um, I, have, I have another dorsal ventral example for you. So if I asked you, um, where is the mandible on the skull? So this is the skull. Where is the mandible? It's ventral. So it's towards the belly. It's down, okay? Now let's talk on a limb. So we remember on the limbs that we're gonna use distal and proximal, right? So distal is more distant, right? It's further away from the point of attachment. And then proximal is nearer to the point of attachment. So if I said, what is the most distal bone in the forelimb? You would say the phalanges, because the most distal is the furthest away. So that's the phalanges. If I asked you which is the most proximal bone in the forelimb, your answer would be the scapula, because that's the one that's closest to the point of attachment. Now, if I said uh, which bone is immediately distal to the scapula? Um, so I've asked you, the scapula is your reference point here. What is the bone that's immediately distal? So further away from the point of attachment, but right next to the scapula is the humerus. Um, if I asked you uh, where is the humerus in relation to the carpals, in relation to the carpals, carpals are my anchor. Where is the humerus? They're further closer to the point of attachment. So those would be more proximal. So the, the humerus is proximal to the carpals. So let's talk on the hind limb. Similar idea, the most proximal bone in the hind limb is the pelvis. I should be using my pen and then maybe I'm not making as much of a shadow. Uh, so the pelvis is the most proximal. The phalanges are the most distal. If I asked you um, what bones are immediately pro proximal to the phalanges, the phalanges are my reference point. And where or what bone is immediately proximal? So immediately proximal is the next bone towards the point of attachment. That's the metatarsals, okay? Now, what if I ask you a bone on the forelimb compared to a bone on the hind limb? So if I said, where is the scapula to the femur? So the femur is my reference point, right? Because it's to the femur. Where is the scapula is the question. So if I draw my arrow, where is it? It's cranial. It's more towards the head, okay? If I asked you, <coughs> where is the femur to the humerus? The humerus is my reference point. Where is the femur? I draw my arrow, it's going towards the tail. It's more caudal. So the femur is caudal to the humerus, okay? So um, I hope you are understanding that. I hope that makes sense to you. 
Um, I will let you know that in you, so you will be asked questions like that. So, um, you know, it, we have fill in the blank questions on this test. So some of the questions are like, the femur is blank to the pelvis. And you would say the femur is distal to the pelvis, right? Femur, where's the pelvis and where's the femur? It's distal. So the pelvis is our anchor, femur is our um, question. So it's more distal. Um, so you might have questions like that where they're kind of fill in the blank, okay? Um, uh, you do have in the musculoskeletal review sheet, um, the practice activity, there are a lot of examples for you to practice with this, okay? If you're not understanding it, um, please let me know. I'm definitely open to going over this like live in the virtual classroom if you're not understanding it. I find this is, a, this is one that people struggle with is using these terms now. So for test two, we memorize the directional terms. So cranial means towards the head. Uh, caudal means towards the tail, but I find actually applying it is sometimes is a little bit tricky for people. So please do let me know if you have any questions. Uh, okay, so we're going to move on from the bones of the skeleton then. Um, and I just want to talk about um, one other thing before we go into the terms, and that is the digits or the phalanges. So when we're counting digits, here are my digits. Um, we're going to count from medial to lateral. Okay, so medial is um, closest to the midline and then lateral is furthest to the side or furthest away from the midline. And we're going to count one, two, three, four, five. And we're going to count those one, two, three, four, five in Roman numerals. Okay, so one, two, three, four, and five. So uh, dogs and cats, as you may know, their one is their dew claw. So they don't have a thumb the way do, that we do, but we have, they have that little dew claw. Some animals don't have their dew claw, right? Um, and almost, well, I shouldn't say almost all, but a good majority of animals don't have any dew claws in their hind limb. So in that case, they have two, three, four, and five. They don't have a one at all, okay? So we go medial to lateral in Roman numerals one through five. If they do not have a dew claw, they just don't have a one. So it's two, three, four, and five. So that's how we count digits in animals. Okay, so let's, I rearrange, sorry, I also have old printouts of these. I rearranged these a little bit for you on your sheets because I felt like they made a little bit more sense. Uh, so I, I'm going to kind of just try to go from memory on the order here. So intervertebral discs. Um, inter means between. Vertebral is referring to the vertebrae and then just discs, right? So these are little discs of cartilage and they're between the vertebrae. Uh, our next term then is intervertebral disc disease. It's abbreviated IVDD. It could also be called a herniated disc or a ruptured disc. So basically we have all these bones of the vertebrae and then they've got these cute little cushions in between them that's the intervertebral discs. If those discs rupture uh, or protrude out what can happen is that they put pressure on the spinal cord and um, and that can cause a lot of pain or sometimes even uh, paralysis. Uh, so this is really prone in animals with long backs. So think like Dachshunds and Basset Hounds. They've got those really long backs and um, they're more prone to this intervertebral disc disease. Okay, so osteoporosis, you guys have probably heard about because it's um, a risk in women, uh, human women, uh, but it's a loss of bone density and increased porousness. So osteo meaning bone and then por meaning porousness or holes, right? And then osis is an abnormal condition. And arthropathy, look at our word parts. Arthra is joint, pathy is disease. So this is just joint disease. Arthralgia, algia meaning pain, arthra referring to the joints. 
arthritis. Arth referring to the joints, itis being inflammation. So arthritis is joint inflammation. If we have osteoarthritis, it's inflammation of the joint and the osteo, the bone. So osteoarthritis is a degenerative joint disease. Degenerative means it gets worse with time. It's associated with aging, so it's way more common in old animals, but it's also present if there's wear and tear in the joint. So um, if an animal has a ruptured ligament in the joint, that can cause problems where the bone is rubbing against the other bones, and we'll start to see the cartilage breakdown, and we'll see bone changes in there as well. It's really quite painful to animals that have osteoarthritis. Okay, so these are two terms that you should uh, focus on learning the difference between, okay? So um, a ligament and a tendon, they're both strong fibrous bands. So we at least don't need to memorize the difference between them in that regard. What makes them different is what they connect, okay? So the ligament connects bones to bones. They also support organs. Um, have you guys heard of an ACL injury? It's a really common injury in sports. It's a knee injury where the ACL, which is the anterior cruciate ligament, ruptures. So that's what gives the knee stability. If that ligament is broken, uh, the knee is really loose and painful, and then we start to see osteoarthritis in the knee. So the ligament is what's holding the bone to the bone in the knee. The other, the other one, tendon, it's a strong fibrous band and it holds muscle to the bone. So there's a tendon in the body that I'm sure everyone is familiar with because it's the largest tendon in the body. It's our Achilles tendon at the back of our heel. Uh, so that Achilles tendon is huge because it's holding our huge calf muscle and attaching it to the calcaneus, which is the heel of our foot. So that Achilles tendon is attaching the calf muscle to the heel bone. So to remember those, the ligament is bone to bone, tendon is muscle to bone. Uh, okay, so cancellated bone is also called spongy bone. And remember I said we'd call back the long bones? We're calling it back now. So uh, remember the examples of long bones was humerus and uh, the femur. Uh, so cancellated bone is found in the ends of long bones. It's also found in the pelvis, the ribs, the vertebrae and the skull. And that is responsible for producing red blood cells, mo or actually, and white blood cells. Most of the blood cells are produced in there. Uh, so I'm skipping down to here, red bone marrow. Cancellated bone has red bone marrow, and that's where the red blood cells are being produced. Um, okay, so periosteum. Um is a tissue. Peri means around. Oste is bone. So periosteum is the tissue that is going around bones. So it covers the surface of bones. Polydactyl. So dactyl means digit. Poly means many. So a polydactyl animal has more than the normal five digits. Polydactylism can be fairly common in cats. Um, uh, you see a fair bit of them anyway. Uh, they look like they have baseball mitts on because their hands look huge because they have so many extra digits. So the most I've seen on one hand was 11. Isn't that wild? So many extra digits. Um, if you've ever been to Key West, um, you can visit like Key West in Florida. You can visit Ernest Hemingway's house. It's now like a museum. He's obviously long dead and does not live there anymore, but it's like a museum kind of dedicated to his life. But while he lived there, he had a cat that was polydactyl. And now the compound of, the, of his house is just filled with all the offspring of this cat and they're all polydactyl. So it's really an interesting place to visit. Um, okay, so myology, we remember that my is uh, muscle, ology is the study of, so myology is the study of muscles. Uh, and then we know that the mandible is the only movable bone in the skull, it makes up the lower jaw. The caudal vertebrae is also known as the coccygeal vertebrae, that's what makes up the tail. And then the tarsus joint is also known as the hawk. Okay. Um, Oh, and then one thing I missed out talking to you guys about 
Um, it applies to both the integumentary system and the muscular system. But uh, the erector pili muscles. So these are little muscles in the skin and they are responsible for making hairs stand on end. So if you've ever seen a cat or a dog with their hackles raised, like picture that Halloween cat or an angry dog, all their hair is standing straight up, right? Or those bottle brush tails of a scared cat. That's the erector pili muscles in action. So pili is referring to the hair and then erector, erect means like standing up. So um, the uh, erector pili muscles make the hair stand on end. So that's something I, I miss talking about in the integumentary system um, as well. So that's something that's located in the dermis there. Uh, okay, I'm just looking back, making sure I didn't forget anything. Okay, so um, you can read up on the musculoskeletal system in your Elsevier textbook on pages 90 to 91. Uh, as well, you can read up on chapter six and seven in your McBride textbook. So I do have for you review uh, practice activities. So I do have the practice activity for the musculoskeletal system. And then as I also have that skeleton diagram for you to complete. Um, one thing I'll say, I don't think I edited the AMP review like the musculoskeletal system review. If there's questions in there about fractures, just go ahead and ignore those. Um, I cut the fracture stuff out of this unit. It used to, I feel like it doesn't fit in here because it's normal anatomy and fractures are abnormal. Uh, so don't worry about the fracture stuff if you come across those in the review section. Okay, so um, that's everything I have to, to lecture about for the musculoskeletal system. If you do have any questions, do please ask. Uh, you can ask in the virtual classroom, you can email me, you can ask me in the chat. Uh, so if there's anything that you're feeling at all confused about, please do ask for clarification. Um, that's everything I have for you. Thanks so much for listening. Bye.